So, what happens next? Where do we go from here? You ain't so tough with that bad boy tuck. I'ma get it how I'm living, I'ma walk the walk. Outline my lines, I rap through thought. Yes, people, what's poppin'? Welcome back to Football Therapy with me, your host, yeah, and I hope you're doing well. Genuinely do hope that. Welcome back to Chelsea News. Uh, today, we're talking about our players, not new signings. Yes, of course, there will be sales and new acquisitions in the future. Talks about financial fair play, PSR rules, and all that kind of gear. But today, we're talking about what we already have. Lots of young talent, new questions, potentially new answers. What's our midfield? Is Gallagher a double pivot player? Are we better off not playing Enzo Fernandez? Is it this hernia problem that he's got? What people are saying about Misha Mudrik? Cole Palmer doesn't have a goal bonus. There are lots of stuff. Really appreciate all you guys joining me here today on Football Therapy. Thank you for joining me. If you do want to support the content, heck, it's easy. All you've got to do is like, comment, subscribe, hit the bell, a few clicks of your finger, a few taps of your thumb, and you'll be helping me out. So thank you for doing that, and let's get into it. I do want to start with a bit of a serious and sombre note to the video. Many of you will know the Chelsea content creator, Angry Rantman, who sadly has passed away recently at the age of like 27, I believe, which is just heartbreaking. Really, really tragic. Uh, many of you will remember him as this, you know, angry rap man, it's in the name, a lot of shouting. That was his niche, the passionate angry fan. But, you know, it was always in defense of a club that he loved. He loved entertaining the people. He was a massive, massive Chelsea fan. Of course, it's a tragic loss to the content creator community, but, you know, far beyond that, it's a heartbreaking loss uh, of life for, for a young man. So I just wanted to start off with a tribute to Abradit Saha. So rest in peace. Alright then, let's get into some football content. So I'm going to utilise some tweets on the Twitter. First off, Cy Phillips tweeting this. Cole Palmer was not bothered by insisting on a goal bonus when signing an £80,000 a week seven year deal for the Blues last September. Well, you might be thinking, oh wow, Cole's gonna regret that because he's currently the top scorer in the Premier League and had he got a goal bonus, he'd be making serious peas and of course, currently, the Chelsea players don't get bonuses unless they qualify for Europe. We may still qualify for the Europa League, but he's certainly not gonna get the Champions League qualification bonus. But I don't think Cole Palmer really minds at the moment. Chelsea, of course, signed him on a seven-year deal, but I believe it's a seven plus one, so essentially it's an eight-year deal. So for, for all the crazy business Chelsea have done, signing Cole Palmer on an eight-year deal for £80,000 a week without a goal bonus is an intelligent masterstroke because he just seems like currently on form he's the best player in the Premier League. I mean, he's top for goals, joint top with Haaland, despite playing in this Chelsea team, which is a magnificent feat, and he's nearly top for assists as well. Sensational stuff. It doesn't surprise me that he's not fretting about this goal bonus, because the dude is on cloud nine, he's absolutely smashing it at the moment, he's probably just really, really happy with how things are going at Chelsea. And of course, it's been reported by multiple different journalists that he will essentially get an improved contract to represent who he is in the team, which I massively endorse, because Chelsea wouldn't need to do that. They could be like, mate, you signed a deal, you're on an eight-year contract, you're on 80k a week. But maybe he was told, look, if you play really well, you'll get an improved contract with bigger incentives. They'll almost certainly reward him with a better contract. That's what's been implied, certainly by Matt Law of The Telegraph. He'll get an improved contract, one where he probably will get goal bonuses and stuff like that. And... You might think that's needless from Chelsea from a cold-hearted business perspective, but I don't think they are completely cold-hearted. Plus also, it's not needless because it shows other players, look, if you become the guy, if you actually put everything into it, you will make more money. So do it. Train hard, become better, and make that money, baby. <laughs> Alright, that's Cole talked about, let's move on. Blue Footy tweeted this regarding Mikhailo Mudrik. Shakhtar Donetsk's chief, Sergi Palkin, said this on Mudrik. Misha is a top European player, a unique talent. I believe coaches need to learn how to use him and his teammates need to learn how to play with him. When I watch Chelsea, nearly all the attacks go down the right-hand side, not the left. Well, there's a reason for that, mate, and we just spoke about him in the previous segment. 
segment. In our club, we realised his strengths and urged our players to use him to the maximum. A lot depends on the coaches and how they treat and teach him. He's still young. They need to have a personal contact with him and show him his weaknesses and promote his strengths. He will deliver at the top level of European football. Yeah, first of all, obviously all our attacks go down the right because we've got Gusto and Palmer. And at the moment, we're playing with Kukurea and, and Mudrik. No offence to either of those guys, they're both good players. Mudrik's got a very high ceiling, I believe. But for the, you know, the, this guy from Shakhtar to say, we used him to his strengths. Yeah, because you basically, I've said this before many, many times, Shakhtar had to, um, you know, rip up the contracts of the Brazilian players. They had to play a certain way with the players that were left. That is, of course, mainly Ukraine internationals like Mudrik. And they essentially played you know, counter-attacking transitional football down into the left channel and let him do what he wants. Great, it worked for you and he demonstrated immense ability, but you can't do that in the Prem, especially to be a top, top side, unless you're like maybe like a Brentford or something. But we need to play systemic, good football that utilises everyone on the pitch and passing patterns and different approaches for different games to beat different opponents. But he's right. Mudrik is a really, really useful tool. Of course, he's amazing playing in the channel and in transition, but Mudrik's got techers as well. He can dribble. He, we saw it you know, the other day when he took the ball off Gallagher and dribbled around people and hammered at home. That, you know, that isn't a player playing in transition. That's a player playing off instinct when we're in the final third. So we need a lot of that too. There will be time for Mudrik. Mudrik will come good, but the, what the, the guy from Shakhtar is saying essentially just doesn't, it's not relevant to Chelsea. We're not going to just sit deep and play to Mudrik in the left channel, especially when we've got all these other players and, you know, great players on the right-hand side. So obviously we're not going to do that. Plus, it's not going to be good for Mudrik. Mudrik needs to develop as a player. He needs to learn how to play all the different facets of football and defensive football and stuff. And whether it's Pochettino moving forwards, who originally was tasked to put an arm around Mudrik, but kind of sort of faded away from that a little bit, maybe thought, Palmer, you're the one. I decide I'm going to, you know, nurture you. Still, I did want to reference this because there is a great player in Mudrik. He will be happy that, you know, Chelsea are picking up form a little bit. He's being involved. He's on the pitch. You know, he scored the old wonder goal. You know, he's got that off his back now. Like, he scored a few important goals for Chelsea. That goal against Newcastle. You know, had we won the League Cup, that would have been a more important goal. But, you know, he's, he's involved. He's settling in. And he's got immense potential. And should there be games where we need to play transition or counter-attacking, he's your guy, and even not, he's still a great footballer, he just needs to be refined, I mean everyone can see it, you know, the, Mudrik has his haters, he also has his stands, probably if everyone thought about it properly, they'd be like, well yeah, there's obviously a lot more to come from him. And I believe we'll see it. So let's move on. So I Phillips to eating this. Moises Caicedo has officially overtaken and registered more successful ball recoveries, 154, than Declan Rice, 153, this season in the Premier League. Now, I did want to talk about this. Of course, it's an easy way to get attention that Caicedo, who's been heavily criticised this season, Declan Rice, who has been heavily praised this season, rightly, by the way, uh, he's taken um, taken over over him in a dominant metric. Of course, context is required here. Ball recoveries is obviously getting the ball back. Chelsea are chaotic, uh, transitional, and generally quite bad without the ball. So you're going to need someone to like mop up like that. Arsenal are a much better coached team than Chelsea this season. So you have the ball more. Therefore, you need to make much less ball recoveries. Also, worth mentioning that Declan Rice has been deployed in that left number eight role when Jorginho plays as a sitter. Uh, you know, Declan Rice is a sensational player. He, he's so good. He's amazing. I'm not saying Declan Rice bad, Moises Caicedo good, but it's a good stat to get your attention and maybe talk about Moises Caicedo and how much better he's looked recently, certainly against Everton. Yes, yes, I know, it was against an Everton side that was shell-shocked and we had a great win and a great, well, been a great moment, but he did look really, really good. Now, this season, Moises Caicedo has looked not good and, in fact, at times, distinctly average. Now, I've said this on multiple uh, platforms on here, I say on my Instagram, which I'm very active on when I speak to people, 
Um, you know, for me thinking he looks like a... He, he's not looking any better than maybe like a £35 million CDM we got from a Portuguese league or something. Do you know what I mean? When really, he's the Premier League record signing at £115 million. Now, it's obviously real tough when you talk about the price tag and the unfair pressure on young players' shoulders, etc, etc. But of course, it is relevant to talk about here. And Moises Caicedo... Obviously, he had a really fast rise. Brighton got him. They loaned him to a Belgium league, got him back, and like he had a really, really impressive sort of um, progression under Potter. And then, of course, the Zerbi. And people who know about footballers' development and their skill set and profiles were just losing their minds over Moises Caicedo. Like, not only is this like a profile of player that a lot of people like. Obviously, everyone wants the striker. Everyone wants that centre forward, that goal scorer. But kind of second place in vogue was everyone wanted this kind of like CDM player, like a proper stopper in front of the back four, but actually could play technical advanced football. Moises Caicedo was that guy. Of course, Arsenal were after him for ages uh, in the previous January to when we signed him. Remember, well, I'm sure you haven't forgotten, but Liverpool had a bid accepted for £111 million, which, of course, would have been the Premier League record signing anyway. We only paid £4 million more because it was a you know a counter bid, and of course Caicedo agreed to come to Chelsea. We fumbled it massively. Had we just gone back, if we could go back in time, I reckon we could sign Caicedo for 80, 85 million pounds, maybe 20 million pounds less. Anyway, whatever. Point being, he was performing badly. Now, many people, maybe correctly, would put that on the manager, Pochettino. I think that's true to some degree. I think also there is an element of young player, record signing, pressure and also needing to learn his teammates there was a time when it looked like he was developing really good chemistry with Enzo Fernandez when they were playing really close together um, but then they sort of dropped form again we'll talk about Enzo in just a moment and of course Caicedo was notably excellent in that Premier League game against Everton where he was playing in the double pivot next to Conor Gallagher now we'll talk about Conor quickly before we talk about Enzo Conor Gallagher, I very much was, you know, explaining my opinion on how I thought he was. He had been playing terribly in a double pivot, not just for Chelsea, but of course for England as well. When he played there next to Declan Rice, I think he just didn't suit him at all. Uh, it didn't suit him for Chelsea. And in fact, I've said it a million times, I don't think he's the best number 10 choice for Chelsea. If we were to play really defensive, which we're clearly not good defensively, so it's not a strong suit that we should be trying to put all our power into. You play him as a number 10, but Cole Palmer got four goals playing as a number 10 last time out. I think Carney Chukwameka, profile-wise, is the most best suited. Of course, we've got Nkunku. Mudrik seemed to play better as the number 10 rather than the left winger. So that's four players that I think suit us better offensively in that role than Conor Gallagher. But Conor Gallagher is an amazing footballer. Of course, he had that amazing time at uh, Crystal Palace playing as a right number eight, which is probably his position. Not as this number 10, not as this double pivot. But, actually, again, it's so hard because it's a small sample size in the Everton game. He played magnificently next to Caicedo, and it made Caicedo look a lot better. So, where are we going here? Genuinely, you'd need a bigger sample size, but of course it's opened up the conversation and question, should Enzo Fernandez be dropped for the game against Manchester City at Wembley in the FA, in the FA Cup semi-final? It's huge, really. Because if he can make Caicedo look better, then that's really, really good. And of course, he should be. He's, I mean, he is better defensively than Enzo Fernandez. When Enzo Fernandez plays in that double pivot, sure, Enzo's tough, and he won't let you get past you, and he's not like Jorginho that will get trampled over. But he isn't fast, Enzo Fernandez. But he's good deep, because when the game's like on front of him, he can play the ball... He can just make, he's better at playmaking. Because when Enzo was playing as that number 10, he wasn't any good. He was the worst of the lot playing in that number 10. It, people thought like, oh yeah, he's this sort of like... Maybe quite attacking midfielder, World Cup winner, we should try him in the number 10. Nah, not for me. Playing deeper, actually a bit like a Regista, but maybe a bit more strong than your Jorginho style Regista. He looked really good, and he was actually getting more goals from starting from a deeper position. But defensively, in theory, Conor Gallagher, because he's a chaser a little bit more... You've got more, you've got two players in Caicedo and Conor Gallagher that can chase the ball around, press and tackle and track back and keep the front four safe. In theory, 
It's so tough because before Everton, it was a disaster. It didn't work. And Everton has such a small sample size. Now, you're probably at this point thinking, Jan, are you seriously saying dropping World Cup winner, best young player of the World Cup, £105 million, Enzo Fernandez? I'm saying probably not. Purely because he costs a lot of money, he is a great player with an immensely high ceiling. Of course, he's come out recently speaking to the media, I believe Chelsea's website actually, saying, look, you haven't seen the proper Enzo Fernandez yet and I'm working towards it. And there's since been some media, I think the news comes out of Argentina, that he's got a long-term hernia problem and he's considering surgery, but that would take him out for three weeks, which of course he's probably trying to see out the season at this point point. It's super tough because I think if everyone had their way to discuss it, Enzo would probably start the final. Maybe Gallagher would be dropped and you'd put, you know, uh, Cole Palmer into the number 10. But the truth is, I think Pochettino, and we will preview this game, will revert to type, drop Noni Madweke, play Cole Palmer on the right, Gallagher in the 10, bring Enzo back in to partner with Caicedo, and maybe they play really well. Maybe Caicedo's like confidence has gone up and everything works out. It's super tough because a lot of people actually think that the attack works better with that new front four. I heard them saying on the Athletic Chelsea podcast that actually Nonny and uh, Cole Palmer work quite well together. I, I mean, I wasn't so sure because they're both left footed right wingers and. Um, I still kind of think Cole Palmer's best position is right wing, but when he scored four goals and a perfect hat-trick from the cam position, I just don't know anymore. I mean, we'll have to see. Maybe, I mean, it would seem naive to do those same four with Conor Gatt. It just seems too attacking, doesn't it? So I do think Enzo Fernandez will come back in. And in his defence, Enzo, if he's genuinely been dealing with this long-term medical problem, I think he's been getting injections before every game, then, yeah sympathy, empathy, and that's not a true representation of how good he can be. But it's a great and interesting talking point, so I wanted to put it out to you guys and see what you have to say about the situation. So do leave your thoughts and feelings in the comment section below. I'll be really keen to, to read what you guys think about this uh, personnel midfielder situation, the selection problem for Pochettino. So I'll read your comments and I'll try and respond to a few. In the meantime, thanks for joining me. Thank you for liking and subscribing. And I look forward to seeing you back here very soon. Peace.